Yes, we will start. Okay, so last uh, class we quickly saw there are seven different uh, uh, parameters on which uh, Sri Krishna showed the Sattvic, Rajasic and Tamasic, out of which we saw six. Quickly in the five probably we saw in the last class. Uh, in this chapter alone there are seven. So we have uh, Tyaga, Jnana, then Karta, Karma, then we saw Buddhi and Dhriti. There is one remaining in this chapter on this Triguna classification, which is uh, Sukham. So we'll quickly see that today and then get into a very, very important uh, issue, the most important issue for today's society, which is Varna, about Varna. Because uh, uh, in Bhagavad Gita, he hasn't spoken in any detail, just one shloka in chapter 4, where he said, Shatur Varnam Maya Srishtam. Guna karma vibhaga shaha, tasya kartaram apimam viddi, akartaram avyayam. After that he left that idea. There are eight shlokas which we will see, uh, 41st shloka to 48th shloka, where there is a good description of the varna. So I want to really spend a little time on it. Even earlier uh, when we discussed, we really took two, three sessions. Great detail I discussed. So I want to also spend a little more time because some of us are again coming and uh, so because this is a very become a issue for many people from many counts. I want to give my perspective on that. But before that, uh, we will see the uh, three types of sukham, which is uh, sattva, rajas, and tamo. So uh, we saw, as I told, we saw three types of tyaga three types of karma and then uh, uh, karta, jnanam and buddhi and dhriti, all that we have seen. So we have three types of happiness which we will see today. So this 19th sloka to 40th sloka, one last time Sri Krishna very clearly and the 40th sloka is a very interesting sloka. It says nothing that ever is, you know, uh, gets birth can escape the the overall you know in other words what he is saying is prakriti prakriti is always guna triguna sahita that's how he concludes this uh, discussions if there is prakriti everything here is prakriti the purusha is the invisible part whatever is visible is prakriti and he says moment you say prakriti you cannot escape the three gunas. Why is he concluding with that? Because he says, don't take guna lightly. As long as prakriti is there, guna is going to be there. That's why this whole discussion on adjusting the complexion of the guna, there is no state where guna will not exist. But there can be a state where guna can be irrelevant to me. Existence is different from relevance. Existence cannot be denied. That's what the 40th shloka says. But what you can do is, you can make it irrelevant to you. Gunatita Bhava, which is what he talks in chapter 14 and so on. So anyway, then we will see he from Guna he moves to Varna. Because in chapter 4 he said Guna Karma Vibhaga Shaha. So when he discuss Guna, he has to get into Varna. And from Varna he gets into Karma. So it's a nice trail of about uh, you know uh, 10 shlokas. So beautifully uh, Sri Krishna has treated, we will see it. And then uh, there is a short description of uh, chapter 6, three shlokas and meditation and uh, four or five shlokas and bhakti. More or less it, it's over. Then closing formalities. That's how the chapter is. So we will see to the extent what we can do today. So in these uh, three types of uh, three, three part classification, here is uh, the definition for sattvika sukham. Yat tat agre vishamiva vishamiva that with at the beginning is like visham. <laughs> That's how he describes. Yat tat agre vishamiva. Pariname, over a period of time it changes. Amrutopamam. What appears, so the most subtle message Krishna is saying is all good things, there is an entry barrier. Because it doesn't look interesting at the outset. 
So you know, in strategy they call this entry barrier. So there is a huge entry barrier. But once you enter and you are able to go in, you have to wait. Later things will happen. That's what he is. That's a subtle message here. Yet tat agre vishamiva. Pariname, it changes. Amruto upamam tat sukam satvikam proktam. So simple definition. All that which is not very interesting to you, which you think is boring, which is uh, what is the use of it? Maybe that is where Satvika is, that's, that's where it is hiding. So we need to have a little perseverance, we need to have a little Shraddha, belief that uh, things will happen, we need to have that kind of a patience. So these are all the subtle messages coming through this Satvika Sukha that he is talking. So, Tatsukam Satvikam, satvikam Proktam Atma Buddhi Prasadjam. So, what does it do, do finally? It gives that Prasada. Finally, we get that, uh, it generates that ultimate Prasada that we, we, we are looking for. So, we need to be patient. We need to get the, we need to know what you are doing is right rather than looking for results. That's not going to happen that easily. Initially, it will look like, uh, you know, I remember, you know, at the age of 16, I started reading philosophy. First book I read was uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan's Introduction to Philosophy. I think for one and a half years I was reading and it was making no head or tail for me. <laughs> absolute nonsense if you really ask me. But by God's grace, I was just reading. I said, let it be anything I'll read. So when I read it, maybe 8th time or ninth time, and also I, that put me into something else. So the value was not understanding what was written there. Value was, because I was reading it, some things which are absolutely Greek and Latin started making small little darts. In search of the darts, I went to a guru or something. That is what it is. So you just take this, you know, this, uh, you know, avidya is little easy. Manage, management, all these are much easier. Vidya is not. That's what it is actually pointing to. I think we have to put in our effort. We need to have a strong belief system that Nakaschit Kalyanakrit Durgatim Tathagachati is very, very important. We must have that belief and broadly know where we are going. I think it will lead us. The, you know, it says, Atma Buddhi Prasada, Prasada Jam is what he says. Finally, I think it will give us. So that is a very subtle message he has given in uh, Satvik Sukham. Then he exactly does the reverse of it and defines uh, Rajasik Sukham. He says, Vishaya Indriya Sanyogat. All that happiness you get out of Indriya and Indriyartha. The raw material for the Indriyas are Indriyartha. There is a Vishaya. That is called Vishaya. The other word is Vishaya. Vishaya Indriya Sanyogat. So the Indriyartha and Indriya, there is a Sanyoga. Which means you have to be necessarily externally focused. Indriyas are meant only for the external world. For the internal world, you don't need Indriyas. For the internal world, you have to switch off. I mean, you don't, you cannot use it. This is for the world outside. So by saying Vishaya Indriya Sanyogat, it clearly says that Sukham that you get in the world outside. Because Vishaya Indriya Sanyoga can happen only in the outside world, not inside world. So very clearly it is talking about outside world. So Vishaya Indriya Sanyoga Yat Tat Agre Amrutopamam. Initially it is very, very interesting. The most shining example is Yayati's story in Mahabharata. Because he exchanged his uh, old age to one of his son, his fourth son or fifth son he exchanged. Then he said, uh, this is like pouring oil into fire. After so many years, he said, uh, so yet arambe, you know, amrutopamam. That is a shining example there. So, uh, agre yet agre amrutopamam pariname vishamiva. And you can look at all these so-called sukha that we get out of outside world must honor the principle of finite return and diminishing returns. On the other hand, nobody on earth will say that I don't want to sleep. In fact, when it is boring, when we are so down and dull, the medicine is sleep. Why? Because that sukha is inside, not outside. It is not a sukha coming out of Vishaya and Indriya. Deep sleep, 
everything is gone. So that is an unending sukha. Whereas all the sukha are ending, how many, you know, I like sweet, but how much can I eat? The same sweet will become vesha for me if I eat too much. The diminishing returns is what he is talking about. That is a universal law. So rajasik sukha will be diminishing. It has the law of diminishing return and it can be counterproductive also. Because it says pariname visham eva. Tat sukham rajasam smritam. So what? What is Krishna trying to say is, see all these shlokas are putting value to things. It is not asking us to run away from anything. Just because this shloka is there, we cannot say, I will now switch off the outside world. Gita never recommended that kind of a thing. It helps us put value to things. How much should you value each of these and what position you should give them? This is, the, I think, the deeper implication of these shlokas. It puts us in a certain reflective mode and it tells us there is a certain value which we should have for Rajasik Sukha. There is a certain kind of a value we should have for you know, Satvik Sukha and so on. So that is what is coming here. Vishaya Indriya Sanyogat, Yat Tat Agre Amrutopamam, Pariname Vishamiva Tatsukam Rajasam Smritam. Then he talks about the third. Yat Agre Cha Anubande Cha Sukam Mohanam Mohanam Atmanaha. This is a Sukha which deludes you right through. It is all only delusion. The so-called uh, happiness is nothing but delusion. It puts you into complete ignorance. It's all mudatva. That sukha he called it as tamasik. So he says, Yet agrecha anubandecha sukham mohanam atmanaha nidra alayaha pramadotam yet tat tamasam mudahritam. Now, in, in this example, you cannot put, if you take, you know, this Asura, Ravana, for example. Ravana's happiness, tamasic part, will only map to three out of these, one out of these three. It is not Nidraya, it is not Alaya, Alasya. It is actually that Pramada. That is what happened. He, you know, he foolishly walked into uh, something called desire, which created only, he was completely deluded which resulted in the complete destruction of him, which we saw in chapter 16, we saw those six-part framework. So it, that is that part of the tamasic sukha that we can relate to many of these asuras at the verge of that destruction. It is pramada, pramadottam. It may not be necessarily nidra and alasya, but nidra and alasya are also part of tamasic. And pramadottam tat tamasam udahritam. So these uh, for 39 shlokas, as I told you, the 40th shloka is a concluding shloka. In which Sri Krishna said, anything which is has a birth, sahajam, that which has sattvajam, whatever is the word he uses, anything which is which has a sense of existence in this, which is part of prakriti joining purusha, it cannot ex escape the prakriti jai gunehi, it cannot uh, escape. They are all gen generated out of this great concept called prakriti, so they are always have triguna is what uh, he actually concluded. So I thought I will just conclude uh, these uh, discussions on Triguna with uh, a quick summary of what is, because he took seven, eight examples here, another three, four examples in chapter 17, all that. But what is the idea? The idea at the end of the day is, on certain basis you will find these three are contrasting very much. That is the basic idea that you have. You have, if you talk about understanding the reality, sattvic is also beyond differences. The differences melt, both in sattvic and rajasic. So as I gave the example of a fully light and pitch dark room, from the perspective of understanding is faultless of wrong and the right variety. So in that sense, the understanding of reality is beyond differences. One is out of enlightenment, another is out of complete delusion. Moha is what uh, makes no difference in uh, tamasic, whereas enlightenment makes no difference at the sattvic level. That's why he says, you know, the 18th sloka in chapter 5, he says, Shvanisascha supakascha pantita samadarshinaha. That differencelessness 
sama you know sama dukkha sukha sushtaha sama loshtha sama konchana all those you will see that samatva comes in sattvic that is an enlightened understanding of the reality or as no difference in a particular way whereas tamasik is no difference out of complete ignorance otherwise they look very similar in some ways rajasik is full of differences and the basis for understanding is complete knowledge is like a room which is completely lit as opposed to a room which is completely dark on the you know tamasik side and rajasik is the vikshepa that avarna which is uh, partly created that's why we are deluded we are confused and we take artha for anartha atma for anatha anatma and things like that that uh, misclassification that's called vikshepa that happens cross classification happens because we are neither here nor there it's a mix of these which is what the descriptions we saw state of knowledge is of complete enlightenment here to complete ignorance and in between you have the confusion which is a partial discrimination it blows hot and cold every now and then sometimes it is very bright sometimes it is not life goals and motivations are self evolution and to perfection in the tamasik it is engage in life for no reason no discrimination nothing whereas in rajasik it is a lot of selfish interests what is in it for me it's all guided by selfish interests that is the life goal and motivation when and these gunas blow out in this much promo, promotion uh, proportions psychological state of the individual embodiment of a perfect human being to a pure animal or perfect animal if i have to use a word like that a fully tamasic and it is not surprising also because in the evolution the evolution called man comes from animal so you know it is like a slider you have to start the first the first promotion from the animal kingdom to a human kingdom will be a person who will be more or less animal tamasik will be more then there is a journey in which he is slowly progressing so that's why this this whole gradation also we will see in terms of uh, what it is also this is what uh, in chapter 13 that famous shloka which i have been quoting again and again prakriti and purusha decided to purusha decided to latch on to prakriti with gunaha asya sangah oh, that's what you know uh, sat asat yonishu that's the shloka so this is what explains this this punarjanma you the abhyakta brahma comes down that is their creation process is there you know taitiro upanishad mundaka upanishad everywhere we see and in asadiya sukta explains how it actually happens and all that so when he comes down and becomes a jivatma then there are two things which get together the purusha which is absolutely pure which cannot do any action it has samarthya but no prerna purusha is the embodiment of samarthya electricity is the embodiment of samarthya fan is the embodiment of prerna so to speak it wants to blow air it wants to supply electricity the potential is with the electricity but the desire is here so to speak so the prakriti brings that desire prakriti brings the gunas prakriti brings the world of multiplicity and purusha is absolutely pure substance that is this god particle descending down so the combination of purusha and prakriti makes the jivatma and because there is a prakriti the world of multiplicity and gunas will happen that's why as what krishna said moment you have sattva existence you will find prakriti jay gunaihi the prakriti will generate the gunas so the 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 rgb will play out the color palette will show up so that will give the world of multiplicity and the gunas now when will the world of action comes only when this happens the red line happens when purusha decides to get stuck with prakriti that's what the shloka said the 21st shloka said that in chapter 13 when purusha decided to go with prakriti using guna as the binding agent then action starts and then starts bhoktrutva also the, the desire is here samarthya is there put since both of them are merged together now get into the act of enjoying also so bhoktrutva comes out the world of gunas and multiplicity leads to world of action so moment you have bhoktrutva sukha dukha is inevitable sometimes it blows hard sometimes it blows cold nobody can escape that rule and because you have sukha and dukha then you will start capturing all the vasanas the impressions start 
you know, gathering in, in, this, in that God particle, which is the pure Purusha. That is called Sanchita Karmas and you know, we, we make errors and omissions and commissions. The whole accounting system starts now. So you'll have to account for all of them. So Sanchita Karmas and Vasanas, which takes us through this route. And in chapter 13, that is why he said, and that is why this entire triplet is about Guna. Because the only way to escape this, the only way to escape this endless cycle of Janma and you know Vasana, Karma, Janma, Vasana, Karma, is to remove that dotted line. Which is, Guna will exist, but we can't, we should make it irrelevant. Moment we make it irrelevant, that is a very high state of evolution. Chapter 14 talked about it in the last five shlokas. Once people reach that, then this link will be cut. Bhoktritva moment it goes, vasanas will never be accumulated. The vasanas get accumulated only because of Bhoktritva. And Bhoktritva is only because of this connection which Purusha made with Prakriti through the Gunas. If you severe this link, all these lines will go. If all these lines go, this will be a diminishing. In a finite number of Janmas, things have to get over and one has to liberate. So I think that is what, that is why this Guna is a very, very important issue. Unless we are aware of Guna, unless we understand Guna is very, very important uh, attribute we need to, that's why chapter 14 is very important. Immediately after chapter 13, that's why 14 came. What is this Guna? How you can modify the Guna? What can happen? All those he has said. It's a small chapter, but an important chapter. Hardly about 25, 26 shlokas, but good, very important shlokas, because that is the final possibility to create this. When he says, Guna Tita has a Uchyate, which is a final prescription in chapter 14, when somebody becomes Guna Tita, what it means is this, this link is cut. That is the meaning. The link is completely cut, which is mean Bhoktritva will not happen, which means things will not affect me. I will engage, but things will not affect me. The Bhoktritva will go because Purusha and Prakriti's connection through Guna is cut. That is the Guna Tita Bhava. Once that happens, this finite rule, rule, route will happen and finally the liberation will happen. That is why Guna is a very, very important issue. So, having said all these, then since in chapter 4, he said, Chatur Varnyam Maya Srishtam, Guna Karma Vibhagashah. So from Guna, he must now go to Karma. Now he has used this Varna argument to actually put all these in place. Now this Varna is a hugely contested. Manusmriti has been hugely abused. People have been talking all kinds of things about Manusmriti and saying all these. So what I am going to do is, uh, I want to quote some shlokas from Manusmriti first. First I want to tell you, I mean, uh, you know, Archit is going through Manusmriti, 2785 shlokas, I can't obviously, you know, it's not. But about 10 shlokas I want to read from Manusmriti, just to give a little sense of where is this text and I want to read from Mahabharata also. Just to give a, what is the the conceptual or the design of Varna. I want first to establish that and then get into the shlokas because there is so much of controversies and so on. Okay. Now, in several chapters, there are so many uh, indications about uh, Brahmana. I won't talk only about Brahmana because the whole contention is on this Brahmana. So I think we have to first get that correctly. So I will read some shlokas and tell what it actually trying to suggest. Here is a shloka in chapter 10. This is 75th and 76th sloka where it says, what should be a Brahmin do? What are, uh, what is a Brahmin supposed to do? So it goes like this. It says, Adhyapanam Adhyayanam Yajanam Yajanam Tata Danam Pratigrihascha Yeva Shat Karmani Agrajanmana He says, Brahmins are allowed to do only six things. That's what the definition says. So what are these six? He says, Adhyapanam. Brahmins can teach. They are supposed to teach. Adhyayanam, do swadhyaya. You increase your knowledge and understanding. Teach, these both are related anyway. Yajanam, do yajna. Yajanam, do yajna on behalf of somebody. For somebody you do be a prohit. So yajanam, yajanam. Dhanam, give. Pratigraham, take. So there are three pairs of activities said here. One pair of activities, acquire knowledge, distribute knowledge, perform yajna for you, for others, 
give and if others give take these are the six things that are being told then in the next sloka he clarifies for your living you can't do all the six that also he says there are only three things you can do for your living you can't do all the six for your living so what are these three he says shannam tu karmanam asya trini karmani jivika jivika for your living you can do three out of these six and what are those three yajanam you can you know uh, officiate for somebody and do yajna for them so whatever they give maybe as a fee or whatever you can take that's the way you can make your living adhyapanam you teach and then for which if you get something live with that right adhyapana cheyeva vishuddhascha pratigraha get from somebody who is very very pure don't take money from everyone vishuddhascha pratigraha you can take not from everybody if only you are convinced it is worth taking from this person you should take these are the only three source of revenue for you you can teach and out of which you get something you can do purohita and people give something take it and if people give you anything first enquire whether the patra is worth taking then take so this is what it says jen chapter 3 there are two references there is 134th shloka in chapter 3 which says jnana nishta dvijaha kechit tapo nishta stata pare tapaswadhyaya nishta scha karma nishta stata pare it says these brahmins can do only this nothing else what they should be doing jnana nishta and there is this order is exactly the order of uh, you know importance if you can do the first thing you should do only that that is the kind of a imp- jnana nishta you should be a jnana nishta you must be just reveling in that ultimate knowledge that is what you should be doing that should be your or tapo nishta you should have a lot of austerity self control sense control dhamma shama whatever you want that is the second thing tapa swadhyaya nishta swadhyaya tapa this acquiring this knowledge and go to the extreme levels of doing that karma nishta astata pare then some of the activities that you are allowed to do you do these are all the four things that you can do this is what it says as far as these brahmins are concerned then there is a definition of who can be called a brahmin there are many places i have picked only one or two from here this i have 186 86th shloka in the same chapter 3 in which there is a definition it says who can be called a brahmin so it says vedartha vitt one who knows the artha of the vedas pravakta cha one who is able to disseminate it well to others you know pravakta pravakta cha brahmachari brahmachari is not the you know the ashrama brahme yah charati one who has entered into that concept called brahman which means he has experienced it brahmachari sahasrada one who has donated 1000 cows that is the fourth sahasrada shatayuscha one who is 100 years old shatayuscha okay eva so 1 2 3 4 5 conditions vedartha vit pravakta brahmachari okay sahasrada shatayuscha eva vigneyo brahmanaha and then he ends by saying pankti pavanaha if you find them in your community they will purify the whole community pankti pavanaha so somebody who is 100 year old is can purify you i think there is a lot of meaning in this you know classification scheme one who is 100 year old can purify the whole lot there is so much of wisdom and uh, learning and all that which would have happened you don't have to explicitly check and all that and sahasradaha and all that are included here okay now i want to quote two shlokas which are very interesting first shloka is he says there are he, say, he calls them as jati matra brahmanas he says there are brahmanas or only jati matra brahmanas so he has from varna he has gone to another where he introduces a concept called jati now i will disc- describe these two definitions he says jati matra upajeevi va kamam syad brahmana uh, brahmana bruvah brahmana bruvah ಧರ್ಮ ಪ್ರವಕ್ತೋ ನೃಪತೇರ್ನ ಶೂದ್ರ ಕಥಂಚನ ಇಸೇಸ್ ಎ ಕಿಂಗ್ ಹೂ ಇಸ್ ವೆರಿ ರೈಟಿಯಸ್ 
and who is actually perfectly following the dharma can take a fellow who is a jati matra brahmana and make him a shudra straight you can take him and throw him there that katanchana any time he can do these people who are jati matra upajivi they live as merely a jati matra brahmana <laughs> that is one reference there are two three places where this word jati matra comes this is in chapter 8 20th shloka in chapter 12 there is another shloka 114 shloka which says it actually de- defines who is this jati matra brahmana and what will happen to them what position i will give in the society for them it says avrata nam no vrata no austerity no very tight prescriptions in manusmriti if you actually have to follow it i think in that's what we have done today we have all exited this brahmana varna actually <laughs> it's very tight it's not easy very very tight so avrata nam amantra nam one who don't utter mantras one who don't know mantras avrata nam who don't practice tapas and austerity jati matra upajivinam so these people are just carrying the birth certificate jati matra upajivinam and you know what he says for such people second sentence says sahasra sah thousand of them sahasra sah sametanam if they get together in a in a meeting or in a congregation parishattam na vidyate they cannot enact any law they have no right to see the earlier system was system was very interesting the power to enact what is to be done what is not to be done is vested with brahmins the power to execute was vested with kshatriyas it's a balance one set will identify in a blind neutral way and it will identify for everyone whatever is the right thing to do the other group will have the endowment of power and resources to execute that it's like judiciary and legislature kind of i mean kind of executive kind of a thing but he says if brahmins are not brahmins in the way i have described they have lost their power to influence any thing in the society they cannot make a law they, they have lost their credibility that's what so in both these places he uses the word jati matra upajiva they are just living just as a jati jati means ja ja comes from janma that's the word jati jati is from birth right then there is another shloka which is very interesting in chapter 2 157 shloka he gives a beautiful example he says yata kashtamayo hasti a, a elephant made of wood kashtamaya kashta is wood kashtamaya is mat pratyay that alone which is mean wooden elephant yada yata yata kashtamayo hasti tata charmamayo mrgah a nice deer made of leather charmamaya yata kashtamayo hasti tata charmamayo mrgah yasch vipro anadiyena anadiyena this brahmin who has not done he has to read he has to pro- acquire knowledge progress knowledge so one who has in done it he is he is also included that trayaste so all the three now so now the example of an wooden elephant a leather doll deer and a brahmin who has not followed what i am calling as who is a brahmin is these three trayaste nama vibramati it is just you no know, the, the the elephant is not a elephant for name sake it is a elephant the leather deer is not the deer for name sake it is a deer like that he says this person is a name sake brahmin he is not a brahmin okay all these anyway there are many more but i will just stop here because i want to conclude something out of this then in vana parva in mahabharata there is an episode in which bima is caught by a snake called nahusha and nahusha happens to be their ancestor and there is a story behind it finally dharmaputra comes and dharmaputra uh, so this nahusha has a conversation just just like yaksha prashna there is a conversation here so there is a question answering and all that there is one question there i want tell the question answer goes to several shlokas but i have taken only two shlokas out of it because that is the essence of what i need now the question is brahmana ha ko bhavet rajan please define a brahmin according to who is a brahmin vedyam kin there is another part of that shloka i have just left it because this is what i wanted to bring so he say brahmana ko bhavet rajan so for which uh, 
so this is uh, in Vanaparva, it is the one eightieth sarga in the twentieth sloka. <laughs> that is what it is. So the reply in the next sloka, Yudhishthira says, Satyam, Dhanam, Kshama, Shilam, Andrasamsyam, Tapo, and Grana. He says seven properties. If all these seven properties, Satyam, Dhanam, Kshama, Shilam, Andrasamsyam, Tapo, Grana, Drishyanti Yetra Nagendra, O king of uh, 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 snakes, where you can see these three seven, these seven qualities in whom you can see Saha Brahmanaha Iti Smrutaha. So this, uh, this uh, uh, snake did not leave him with that answer. Then it said, it quoted the answer, there are lots of these Vaisyas, Shudras, Shadriyas also have all these. Now what are you going to tell me? I find all these and these. So he is coming from Jati. It looks like he is coming from Jati classification to understand this. So for which he gives another answer. He says, Shudre tu yet bhavet lakshma dvije tacha na vidyate Okay? Nave shudro bhave shudraha brahmano nacha brahmanaha So what it says is, if these if these seven properties are to be found in a Shudra as per your class, since you asked me, I am telling you, if these seven qualities are found in a Shudra, Shudre, Chai, Yat, Bhavet, Lakshma, all these Lakshyas are there, Navai Shudro, Bhavet, Shudraha, I will not classify, classify him as a Shudra. Then the counterpart he says, Dvije Tacha Na Vidyate, if in a Dvija I don't see this, these seven properties I don't see in a Dvija, then he says, Brahmano Nacha Brahmana. He is not a Brahmin. So like this, there are many references that I just picked this. Why I brought this? Now let me... So with this background, because this Manusmriti, these Puranas, they actually bring a very different... In fact, they are all talking about Varna. They are not talking about Jati. And where they have talked about jati, they, I have, that is why I brought all these examples. Where he says, jati matra upajiva. He says, they are all namesake and they will, be, they will lose all their, those kinds of things are there. So, the point I am trying to make is, if I had to make a quick conclusion with these shlokas, I mean there are many more, but if you take these shlokas, these are some of the things which appears to me. First of all, there is something called varna, there is something called jati. Okay? Krishna said Chatur Varnam Maya Srishtam. Krishna never said Chatur Jati Maya Srishtam. He said Chatur Varnyam Maya Srishtam. So Varna, I went to the dictionary and found what is this meaning of Varna. Varna, it says, is a color. It's a shade. Okay? It's a hue. In the RGB, you know, that's a kind of a thing. So the dictionary meaning of Varna is a color or a hue. It says a class of men, a set of people or a tribe or something. It says a class of race, kind or species. This is a definition for Varna in the dictionary. If you look at Jati, the clear definition is form of existence fixed by birth. That is the definition of Jati. That's why the word Ja, Ja is Janmana. So first of all, the first thing I have understood after reading this and reading this many number of times is Jati is not equal to Varna. That's why Jati Matra Brahmana, that kind of references are coming. There is something called Jati, there is something called Varna. Entire spiritual texts and Puranas or Smritis are talking about Varna, not about Jati. So the question is, what are these two? To me it appears Jati is an operational arrangement, which comes out of a birth certificate. You are born, you are, uh, you know, registrar of whatever your government office, Tasildar office, somebody will give you a chapa and give you. So it will ask, what is your father's caste? It will write the same caste and put a chapa and give it to you. That is called jati. It is a simple operational arrangement for some mechanisms. They are doing it. We don't know why they are doing it, but they are doing it. Whereas varna is a conceptual classification. It is not a classification on, for operational convenience. The eight shlokas that we will see now will clarify it so well. Varna is actually a conceptual classification, not an operational arrangement at all. It is a wonderful conceptual classification which is driven by guna. That's why it comes after the triguna discussions. A varna comes out of guna. It doesn't come out of birth certificate. 
it comes out of guna so varna is a conceptual classification on the base this chaturvarnya maya system guna karma vibhaga that's what he said he used guna and karma i will explain it a little bit so what is this varna that you will find in all these descriptions varna is actually playing a very very important role what role it is playing it first of all it it tries to tell it actually helps us organize our work because it is all related with karma and work and all those are coming because you know what is varna trying to tell varna says in this world wherever you go you go to america you go to israel you go to india you go anywhere he says you can take the entire population and put them under four pigeon holes this is what varna is saying and what is that there is one set of people who will be highly contemplative and selfless this is one group they will be highly contemplative in nature and they will be selfless you will find this wherever you go such people will be there there is another group that you will find they will be highly active and selfless they are all bundle of energy but selfless that is the sort is coming actually there is a second cluster of uh, what you will find third he says highly active but with a, with a strong selfish motive people can be like that you know you can you know put everybody into the same compartment i mean it is very unnatural so he says there is a third group which is highly active but fairly selfish also he says there is a fourth group you will always find where people will be very physically active they cannot be active mentally please don't ask everybody to be a great thinker here you are actually trying to take the same brush and paint everything the same people say i will not take science group i will take only commerce group because i can't do this much of science it is our natural feeling so varna system says wherever you go these people can be put into these four compartments and therefore it said you this is like modern management you know in modern management what they do is they in an organization this is exactly what what is happening in modern organization in an organization they first write the role descriptions they say this job requires this much this kind of uh, capability this kinds of skills this kind something requires more mental skills more innovation inside the box thinking out of the box thinking all those so it writes all the requirements and then they map it on to all the qualifications that they require and so on and that's how they go out and locate people and fill that position that is the idea here this is attempting on the entire samaj it says people will be like this and why they are like this he bring the guna that's how the whole discussion comes now you now you have to explain why some people are very active and selfless uh, some people are you know selfless and hugely contemplative why some people are physically they, they have the absolute joy when they exert physically that's what it is some people can have the bliss ultimate bliss only when they physically exert some people if you ask them physically exert you will have to just admit them to the hospital they can be great contemplators i mean it's all possible so that is what is coming out and krishna is actually using these to say all these will come only from your complexion of the guna it cannot come from nowhere so that is what it is doing and so in a way understanding of varna which is related to the guna essentially maps it into one's skills and his nature his composition what is his natural temperament how we see naturally dispose all those are coming from the guna which leads into any one of these four buckets <coughs> so which is what is really happening in this kind of a thing so let us see how he articulates this idea so there is a difference between varna and jati jati is an operational arrangement of things whereas varna is a conceptual classification of things which means many jati membership can map into a varna membership in a very different way because this is based on a certain kind of guna that is based on some operational arrangement which we have done for whatever i mean we tend to be get together and then we try to you know that's a different thing that's a social behavior so this and this can be mapped in very different ways if you really look at it and history has plenty of examples anyway if you want to see plenty of examples you have everywhere you can see this that this and this are completely mapped in a you know very different way so in the world of activities we need to classify jobs 
So we have to, at the end of the day, we have to get things done. We have to get things done, which means we need, I mean, you can't have the whole city of only thinkers, then city will become dirty, nor you can have the whole city of only people who can sweep. Either ways are not possible. It's a very practical, I mean, this institute, we need a class 4 employee, we need a class 3 employee in the government parlance, if I have to say, it is a class 1, class 2, class 3, class 4, because that's the only way it works. And every corporate does the same thing. They say, this is the kind of skill I need, I look for who has it and they take it. That, in a very societal way, this whole thing looks like that. That there are people, skills, jobs, so we need to map. So that is, seems to be the idea of a Varna. Okay? So, therefore, this is only, operational arrangement of Jati should not come in the way of the excellence of uh, the Guna and the Varna, which is a different thing. You don't have to perfectly, you know, pack it into it and then suffocate people. This and those are two different things. They can map in very different ways. That is what you see if you read all of them. That is the perspective that is coming out of it, which has been completely kept aside. We look at it in a very different way now. We have first said Jati equal to Varna, whereas I am not going to agree to it. Jati cannot be equal to Varna. The simple truth is you take uh, only, uh, you know, sons I know fairly reasonably well is 12 Arvars and 63 Nayan Mars, there are no, hardly any Brahmins there, but they are all celebrated. In Tamil Nadu, 63 Nayan Mars, there is a big festival. They are gods. In Madras, for if you go in the month of March, you cannot go near Mailapur. The whole city will be blocked. Because 63 Pallakis, in 63 Pallakis, these 63 Nayan Mars are taken and taken around. I, not even one is Brahmin, I think. So, this Jati Iti is not equal to Varna. They are all very different. Same true of Alvars also. So, this is the nearest example I can easily relate. So, traditionally, we kept this different and that different. Today, we have muddled both of them and then, you know, doing things differently. So, if you want to keep Varna as a conceptual classification, let us understand what is he saying. Why are, why, what is he looking at this Varna? That's what uh, is the issue. Huh? We have two One fell off. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So in chapter 14, even we talked about Gunatraya, he said very clearly, this is a very important shloka. He said, Rajas tamas chabi buye sattvam bhavati bharata. For some people, sattva will just dominate and it will push down the rajas and the tamas. It will happen. Sattva, rajas tamas chabi buye. You just overpower rajas. Because it is a measure of our evolution. We are all, you know, moving in this plane. So he says, Rajas tamas chabi buye sattvam bhavati bharata. Rajas sattvam tamas chaiva. So, rajas in some people will pull down the sattva and the tamas. In some other people, tamas will pull down the sattva and the rajas. So, now there is going to be, out of the sattva, rajas, tamas, we will now be able to rank order. For some people, sattva will be top. For some people, rajas may be top. For some people, tam So, this is possible. This is what he said. And that's what, uh, you know, Aishankara's commentary and Varna also said, used only guna. He said, people's disposition makes a varna out of them. That's what he said. For example, he says, Brahmana subhavasya sattva guna haya prabhava haya karanam. So he gave, actually, he says, such people, jati, let it be there. For such people for whom sattva is really on the top, they are brahmins. So it's a varna definition. They are Brahmin. That's why 69 Mars are gods. They are more than Brahmins for us. They are gods actually. Literally gods. Ardvars are gods for us. You will find their uh, big thing happening. So he says, the set of people in which Sattva will be the dominant, they are actually by Varna Brahmins. Tata, in the same way, Kshatriyasya Subhavasya Sattva Upasarjanam Rajaha. What he says is, Rajas will be high, followed by Sattva. Sattva will be slightly pushed, and Raja will be a little more than the Sattva. Tamas will be the lowest. That's what it is saying. In the first definition, Rajas and Tamas both will be less. Sattva is the only one which is being talked about. Then Vaishya Subhavasya Tama Usarjanam Rajaha. Tamas will be a little higher, followed by Rajas, then followed by Sattva. And Shudra Subhavasya Raja Upasarjanam Tama Prabhaha. It says the 
the, this Varnakal Sudra, where the Tamas will be very high, followed by Rajas and then Sattva. So some definition he, he said on the basis of how the three gunas actually make our disposition. Will, will, us make, will make us very contemplative, selfless, will make us very active and selfless. The Kshatriyas are supposed to be very selfless and active. If you read Manusmriti, Kshatriyas and Brahmins are put on the top. It's a perfect balance between these two. One is given credibility, one is given power. But in return, the expectations of these two are very high. And there are references where slightest, if they deviate from that, they'll be thrown. To the lowest, they'll be just thrown. So it's a balancing of that kind which you see there. They want it because they want, have to be selfless. One is very active, one is contemplative. Together they can make a winning combination of running the organization called society. That's a kind of a conceptualization that you see there. So if I put all of them into numbers, because you know, it becomes a, so it is actually a permutation combination now. You have S, R and T, Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. So the question is which, so actually it is a 3C2 combination. If I had to use a little permutation combination, the first position can be either Sattva, Rajas or Tamas, in terms of dominance I am talking. First position can be one of the three will be dominant. The second position will be, there are two ways you can fix the second position, because one is already fixed. And the third you can fix only one way, so three into two into one, six possibilities. The six possibilities I have put here. Okay? Six scenarios. So uh, in the first scenario, Sattva is the dominant. The numbers are only indicating that. You know, don't take numbers seriously. Sattva and Rajas is next and Tamas is very, very low. The second case, Sattva is high and Tamas is very high, Rajas is uh, very low. That's not possible. There is a continuity. These, these gunas are all very continuous. You don't jump from here to here. It's a slow evolution that happens. So the scenario 2 and 5 are not possible. It's simply not possible. There is no continuity. You can't have a, a fair amount of sattva and a lot of tamas and very little rajas. That's not possible. It's, there is a continuity between these three gunas. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So that takes out two. The remaining four are the four varnas. That's how they have come to this whole uh, arrangement finally. In terms of how did they actually get these four broad shades of grey from the black and white that you can have. Put some combination and they got this. That's exactly the shloka says. So if I do this over, the shloka becomes a little easier. The shloka says, Brahmana Kshatriya Visham Shudranam Chaparantapa Karmani Pravibhaktani Swabhava Prabhavaihi Gunaihi He says, each of this person has a certain guna. A certain combination of S, R and T, Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. And because of that, it is good for him or her to engage that in which they will be the best. See, the biggest mistake that we have done today is a person who is extraordinarily creative. I know a person who is extraordinarily creative. is languishing in a software company, actually, and coming home from night, evening 7 o'clock to night 12 o'clock, he does some work astonishingly good I you know I know somebody who constantly gives him work I asked him where are you I, mean, I wanted to see him he was so good he does some glass etching on a, you know he does Sharda he does the, the, these you know goddess and in what size you know it is a size of something like uh, about uh, 12 feet by 8 feet kind of a glass in which he so beautifully does he is a software engineer alas he is a software engineer he is actually killing himself but enjoying. Because daytime work he is not enjoying. His, his true nature is this. Which he is doing after coming home. And how long he is going to do like this because it will affect his health. This is rampant today. Whereas what Krishna is saying here is Karmani Pravibhaktani. This whole world of activities are, are like this. That we should align our guna to that. We, we will find it actually most satisfying. That is what he is trying to say and that's how these four varnas must happen. So, you know, if you have too much of sattva, it should be like these kinds of jobs are better. If you have too much of rajas, that is better and, and so on. That kind of, uh, uh, you know, rajas and then tamas, sattva and rajas, shradriya and things like that. So, essentially, if I, if I have to actually, you know, put it in a different uh, way, I had a very interesting, let me see if I can... 
No, I'll just leave it here. I'm already spending too much time. I don't want to get too much into it. Anyway, earlier I spoke in great detail. Now, when he de defined, this is the most interesting thing. When he defined, just see how he is defining, how will he define a Brahmin and how will he define a, uh, you know, Vaisya, Shudra, Kshadriya, just see how he is defining. This is a definition for Brahmin. He say, Shamo Damas Tapas Shaucham, Kshantihi Arjava Mevacha, Jnana Vijnanam Astikyam, Brahma Karma Sobhavajam. It, it talks about nine attributes. It never talked about anything but attributes. It says, a person who has a Shama, which is internal control, Dhamma, which is external control, you know, you are not inebriated. And you are, you are controlled in thought also. Shama is, Dhamma is hitting. You know, Madha, Madha is hitting. Dhamma is not hitting. Shama is not hitting through thoughts. You should go to that level. Your violence cannot happen in thoughts. That's the finer, finer, fine, finness of, uh, you know, your, your nature getting refined. That is Shama. Shama, Dhamma, we have seen it several times in the past. In 20 values also we have seen it actually. Shamas Dhamma, Tapa, Shaucham, Kshantihi, Arjava, Mevacha, Jnana, Vijnana, Mastikyam. It's all about knowledge, realize knowledge, belief in the existence of the larger force. Spend all and spend in activities which are all about that ultimate principle called Brahman. One who has all these attributes are called a Brahmin. This is how he actually talked about Brahmin. For Kshadriya, he came with seven attributes. He said, Shauryam, he should be a Shura. He should, he should have a lot of prowess or valor. Shauryam, Tejaha, Dhritihi, lot of fortitude, lot of energy, right? Darkshyam, I used the word Darkshyam last time also, you know. Darkshyam is executional excellence, competence. Darkshyam, Yuddecha Apalayanam, this is put for uh, Arjuna particularly. Yuddecha Apalayanam, not running away from the war, which is what he is seriously contemplating now. Yuddecha Apalayanam, Dhanam, ability to give. The pleasure of giving. Ishwara Bhava, you should feel you are the Lord. The feeling of Lordship, you need a lot of Rajas to do it. And to do all the other things, you need a lot of Sattva. Selflessness and activity, activity is what makes a great Kshatriya. There must be a lot of selflessness and there must be a lot of vitality. These two makes a Kshatriya. So that is what you will find here. You will find Shauryam, Tejaha, Dritihi, Darkshyam, Yuddecha, Apalayanam, Dhanam, Ishwara Bhavascha, Kshatram Karma Subhavajam. So that's what he described here. Then, his, with respect to the Vaishyas and Sudras, he talked the duties and not the attributes. This is a very marked contrast. And this contrast is no way surprising. You go to a top you, company and then go to a headhunter. Or you go to a company and apply. If you are applying for CXO position, they will not talk about what work you will do. You will do. They will talk about what skills you should have. If you have to do a higher work, they will not talk about the work. They will talk about what kind of a person you should be. For a lower level, it is better you tell the work clearly. That is, you know, unambiguously you should say this is what is expected out of you. Yeah, your reception desk, you don't talk about a person so much, but talk about the work. You are supposed to do this much, you know, this kind of calls, you have to attend this, attend this. That's so, same idea here. Because the scopes are different, na? In different organizations at different levels, the scopes are different. Society can be no different. So here he talks about duties rather than attributes. So he says, Krishi go, go raksha, in the Krishi and go raksha vanijyam, what we should understand is they were the drivers of economy. So that is how we have to understand now. So what it is saying is, Vaishya's greatest activity is to drive, they are the kingpin of the economy. Without Vaishya's economy will not drive. So it, the Krishi, go raksha and vanijya is an indicator of how do you drive the economy in, in substantive words, substantive ways? That is what uh, is what it is talking. Vaishya karma sobhavajam. Yes, and paricharyatmakam karma shudrasya api sobhavajam. There is a lot of work to be done here. A lot of work to be done. You know, in a city, you have to run a bus. It's a hard work. Driver job is is. I mean, it's all work. Think, if everybody start thinking there is no possibility, if everybody start working also there is no possibility. So it is all a mix. So here it talks about work, people who are very engaged in work and they are all the time excited by work, 
that is the kind of uh, duties which are told about for right now in the next four slokas he does something astonishingly interesting you know all that that we have talked about about the varna there is a very important question that will come if you really ask what would be the when can the varna system be robust these are all the definitions now now this varna system will be robust only when a few things happen and if those things don't happen this varna system will collapse like anything what are those first thing varna no matter what you de define which is what the reality is these are the four things a varna system must do which a jati system will not do but a varna system will do and must do number 1 it is everybody's birth right to be spiritual you cannot block it just because you do some work you cannot say you can't be spiritual you can't say that if you built a system like that that system is will collapse with internal conflicts so everybody's birth right to be spiritual because infinite spirituality is with everyone that has nothing to do with the varna in fact it has nothing to do with the jati also this has to be ensured if you can't ensure it then it is of no use correct this is point 1 point 2 there is no way you can compromise on the dignity of labor a person driving the bus is as important as a person who is cleaning the toilet as important as a person who is actually thinking the economic policy of the country as important as the person who is actually running a household how can there be any difference in that so dignity of labor is very very important you cannot compromise or touch that this is a second condition third condition work cannot deprive one of meaning today these are the challenges a person who is a class 4 employee is eternally condemning himself because the society is all now looking at dignity of labor is taken out so he sees no meaning in his work so there is a bad attitude that they bring loyal employees suffer from that not for their any other reason they systemically there is a problem now which we don't seem to worry about we are all in a different position we are all happy so work cannot deprive people of their meaning meaning making is very very important that cannot be deprived that's the third condition and fourthly work because i engage in some work it cannot stunt my inner growth every one of us have a right for inner growth i have to grow internally here externally growing is what we are worried all the time today but every one of us must have inner growth that cannot be challenged now the next four shlokas if you see this is what krishna is saying he it is a master stroke he has four shlokas in which he ensures that these are there that's the spirit of those three four shlokas i don't know how many of those shlokas i pulled out but let us just see in fact i have taken not all the shlokas but i have taken the most important things look at what he is saying here yata pravritti hi bhutana is a great one of the greatest shlokas in bhagavad gita i would put these as one of the greatest shlokas in bhagavad gita yata pravritti hi bhutanam yena sarvam idam tatam svakarmanatham abhyarchya siddhim vindati manavah first thing he says is every person will reach siddhi will reach the ultimate of his where he has to reach how swakarmana tam abhyarchya his work you know in vidana sauda it says work is worship alli dodda alli bardidare in that uh, main uh, government of karnataka thing that's what he saying swakarmana tam abhyarchya by you know doing a archana making an offering to him who yata pravritti hi bhuta that who is described in the first line yata pravritti hi bhutanam yena sarvam idam tadam the whole world has come from some force offer your work to him if if we can offer our work to him lots of work related dignity issues all those will be hugely addressed he says if every one of us do work in fact these greatest people at the different levels of jati who became the greatest varnas will fit here actually they were doing work as pure worship their way they were they were, in, they were internally growing they were actually internally growing nothing was stunting their internal growth because that is what they did swakarmana tam abhyarchya siddhim vindati manavah 
the only way you reach ultimate salvation is you express yourself through your work and see God there. That's what you know, people like Mother Teresa, it's like great social workers have done only that they have seen God in work. If you see God in work, all work related challenges will just one shot it will go. First for an individual. First for an individual it will go. Forget about the others. First for the individuals, lots of this work, work will become more meaningful. I will have the credibility of what I am doing. I am not bothered what you are thinking. I will have enormous credibility and dignity of what I am doing because I see work as a way of worshipping. So that's what he is saying here. In the previous shloka is also good. There are two, three shlokas in which he actually establishes this. And then look at see what he is saying here. Sahajam karma kaunteya sadosham api natyajet. Okay? Sarvarambahi doshena dhumena agnina avrtaha. He says, Sahajam. Right? Now, let me tell you, now people ask, is this Varna by birth or Varna by work? This is a question they ask. I had enormous thinking, I am now 100% understood that Varna is by birth. But I tell you, there are two, two ways to understand it. Moment I say Varna by birth, people normally what they understand is birth certificate. That's not what I mean. If you have understood these 18 chapters so far, you will understand what I am saying. What, where is your guna coming from? Your guna is not coming from nowhere. Guna is from previous janma. Guna is an accumulation of thousands and thousands of janmas. So when is this guna manifesting? When you are born. Your guna cannot be changed. Superficially you can adjust a little bit. Guna comes from thousands and thousands and thousands of janmas. And that, if you take that understanding, then varna is by birth. Because you have brought something. You have brought something over a period of time. And that is what you brought out. Moment you say Varna is by birth, today what people understand is, you know, my father and so therefore not that birth. This birth is a philosophical interpretation, not the operational interpretation. That is an operational interpretation. That Tasil there has no other job to do. He asks what is your father's caste and then he gives a chapa. That is by birth is a different kind. It's not a birth certificate. This is a certificate you are bringing from janmas after janmas after janmas. That's why Krishna has said, Chatur Varnam Maya Krishna Guna Karma Vibhagasha. And the karma there is not work, it is Sanchita Karma. It is this. What I meant is this. The guna and the karma is what you come with when you are born. So if you take that perspective, our varna is at the time of birth. And that is why no matter what jati in, you will actually actually be different in Varna because your guna is not dictated by who is your father. In fact, Buddha's father can never be a Buddha. Buddha's son can never be a Buddha. There is no heredity possible in spirituality. Buddha's father was a great king and he was very worldly. And Buddha was not. Aurobindo's father packed Aurobindo at the age of three, sent him to UK. He never wanted him to have an iota of Indianism. So he sent him at the age of four. Only to return at the age of 27 to become the greatest philosopher in this country. It cannot be stopped. It is all guna. It is at janma. So if you take that perspective, varna is by birth. But not the by birth which people are talking today. That is the wrong definition. When I say birth, guna, karma. Karma is sanchita karma out of which you pulled something. You have vasana and guna. With that you actually... The time you are born, all these are there. It takes 20 years to find out what it is. But it, it's all already impregnated and sent. That is the meaning. So, nothing, no genes. Nothing. Sir, genes these are all only Prakriti Vishesha. This is Purusha Vishesha. <laughs> Sir, genes is for Stula Sharira. We are talking about Linga Sharira. It's a good question actually. The genes, genetic, is only for Stula Sharira. My face may look like my father's face at most. Voice may resemble. These are all Stula Sharira. Genetic and biochemistry is one, can change only Stula Sharira. It cannot change my linga sarira. No. no. That's what, this is not possible, only that will happen. The guna and the karma brings a certain prarabdha and manufactures these genes. It, it selects the parentage and goes and joins there. It's very elaborately discussed in Puranas. How this soul which goes, how it comes back, 
and it's and i have read i don't remember which purana i read if it is if a son or a daughter is not to be born for me it will pass through the stools that much detail is there it will keep on searching the right uh, thing and get into the vitality and get into the uh, father and get into the mother it's very detailed described it works the other way it manufactures the genes it does the selection after that you can make little bit uh, with genetic you can change the stula sharira linka sharira is coming that's why it is guna karma vibhaga sharira <coughs> yes that is how it is uh, described in great detail so sahajam karma kaunte he says your nature will put you in a particular kind of a thing which will fit very you in this edition this is only one edition after all it is one edition in this edition it will put you some somewhere sometimes you know the work that you have to do may have some dosha but don't worry about all that your alignment is the most important thing that you should worry so what he is saying he says sahajam karma kaunte sa dosham api na tejet because this karma has come along with you because it's all your makeup your makeup is at the time of your birth so that sometimes they look like a little bit not already right, but don't leave it because all that which had dosha can be cleaned understand that can be cleaned over a period of time just like you know the smoke can be fanned away and the fire will finally manifest dumrena agni avrta it's just you need a fanning technology so the fanning technology is the prasada buddhi you bring the prasada buddhi your guna will this sattva rajas tamas will start changing so now you can make a better choice in the whole trajectory will happen so that is what he is saying so actually this shloka i didn't bring all of them 44 45 46 47 48 collectively it talks about dignity of labor it talks about meaning making importance of aligning work i think the next shloka will also have it 49 also anyway then so this 40 to 48 so what is happening is so much talk about guna then he says guna is what will finally make up your your complexion and if your complexion is a particular way you will fit into one of these this is where he is going there are four broad clusters you can get only into the pg in hole by getting to the la, uh, some other pg in hole you will actually destroy your progress is what he is saying don't get into some other pg in hole get into the pg in hole where uh, then then that's what the last shloka said you can remove the smoke and fire will come don't worry sahajam sa dosham natyajet don't leave it that your nature only is your way, synergy for you to go forward so that's how he brought the varna and nowhere he said jati he never said he, so he never said brahmin you are brahmin if your father or grandfather is a brahmin that definition is not there nowhere in fact you will find nowhere such definitions the varna is a very different classification it says this is your nature that comes because of your guna and the karma which over years and janmas you have brought it so this is what will be good for you and through that you go you will have the synergy for improving don't get elsewhere in chapter 3 he talked about all this shlokas 30 to 40 you know 30 to 35 you will find he says you know sodhanam sodharme nidanam shreshtam bara dharma bhaya vaha there's a shloka he says death in your own dharma is better than trying to do in some other dharma like that there is one shloka same thing is coming here also same shloka is slight like, yeah which i didn't use but the same shloka is here also 47 shloka which i didn't use anyway so uh, that is how he linked the guna so guna is the crux of everything that's what krishna is telling again and again in this whole discussion that he is getting into that's why the entire third triplet is all about guna so finally what it means is unless we are seized of this concept called that every one of us have a guna that guna has a complexion and that complexion needs to be consciously changed that's the real trajectory for progress that is what is the loud message in the third triplet of bhagavad gita then there are two three shlokas uh, which because this is a summary chapter so therefore some ideas are being summarized so here quickly chapter 6 which is on you know dhyana yoga that is quickly summarized in two three shlokas uh, you see here then there is a summary of the bhakti yoga with that the teachings come to an end actually so we'll see these shlokas he says vivikta sevi laguhashi yata va kayamanasah 
ధ్యాన యోగ పరో నిత్యం వైరాగ్యం సముపాశ్రిత సో ఈ సడ్ అభ్యాసేన తు కౌంతేయ వైరాగ్యేన చ గృహ్యతే ఇస్ వాట్ ఈ సడ్ ఈ సడ్ యునో అసం చంచలం హి మహాభా మనకృష్ణ ప్రమాది బలవద్రడం తస్యాహం నిగ్రహం మన్యే వాయోరివ సుదుష్కరం ఇస్ వాట్ ఈ ఆస్ట్ you are telling all nice things about uh, meditation mind control but it is like catching air in the open that's not possible for which when he replied he said asamshayam mahabaho mano dushnugraham chalam abhyasena chukaunteya vairagyena chukrihyate so that's the vairagya he is bringing here he says vivikta sevi ekaki yata chittatma all those are there in chapter 6 Sol- solitude values that's what he is saying here again vivikta sevi try to be alone being alone is the biggest challenge for modern society very difficult we need at least an ipad or a cell phone or a tv or something otherwise it is very scary but he is saying vivikta sevi right lagu ashi eat less no yukta ahara viharascha yukta karmasya chestha sa very nicely he said that he said how moderation na ati stritam ati neecham don't sit in too high place don't sit in a too lower place he says ati sapna shila ati jagrata don't sleep too much don't uh, wake up too much and uh, don't anashnan or ati anashnan all those are there in chapter he is summarizing all of them here in one shloka I, I, we are seeing all that lagu ashi yata vak kaya manasah so control your tongue <laughs> right control your body comfort then control your manas also bring it to a certain level of under your he should listen to you rather than you listening to it that is the point he is making so all these are that you know patanjali sastra ashtanga yoga will also get us here are all coming to the same path anyway so he is talking yata va kaya manasah dhyana yoga paro nityam parah nityam so that is how you get this dhyana yoga where you have solitude solitude being alone learn to be being alone have moderation in behavior yukta ahara viharasya yukta karmasya cheshtasa everything you moderate don't overdo to the extremes come to the middle lagu ashi you know all that he is saying bring your mind your body and your tongue to a fair amount of it is in a position to listen to you then your dhyana will start happening until then the dhyana is not going to happen it is all about distraction so dhyana yoga paraha nityam vairagyam samupashritaya so that you, you will develop the dispassion and samyak upashritaha that is so the, he he condensed all those several shlokas in a shloka here those two three shlokas in which he condensed the crux of the you know uh, teachings in chapter 6 of uh, bhagavad gita this is just uh, one of them in fact towards the end of chapter 6 he talked about all this and he talked about it in any number of places right brahma bhutah prasanna atma na shochati na kankshasi na kankshati samaha sarveshu bhuteshu mad bhaktim labhet param so he says that vairagya and the nitya upasana that you are able to do by slowly slowly shanai shanai hi uparame there is one shloka buddhya driti grihitya there is one shloka in chapter 6 that he really says go one step at a time one step at a time one step at a time slowly 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 and there also he said what will happen you know shlokas 27 to 30 if you find 26 to 30 he talks about once you master the art of dhyana what will happen that is what is being summarized here so he says brahma bhutah prasanna atma that prasann atma there will be a prasannata the chanchala of the mind will settle and open up for prasanna atma otherwise mind is vibrating vibrating and full of thoughts thinking about 100 things moment we are able to bring it slowly slowly and slowly and then settle it on the ground that is the state of prasannatma there is a prasannata and in that state na shochati na kankshati the world of duality will while they may exist they may not map on the the cognitive mapping will not happen on the mind so na shochati na kankshati and because of that the samatva will come samah sarveshu bhuteshu that is the hallmark of bhakti so if you really ask what is bhakti bhakti is not a cult a way of dressing a particular uh, sign we put on our forehead and then look down upon others somewhere unwittingly sometimes we get there it is not 
bhakti is beda bhava should go and aikya bhava must come that is the hallmark of i mean these are all fine we can start here they are all very useful to start but to think that is the destination is a mistake they all are very useful i think uh, yeah, yes, yes, satsanga will be very useful but we should know quickly how to graduate from there for this goal post so samaha sarveshu bhuteshu will give mat bhaktim because then matta parataram na anyat kinjit asti dananjaya mayi sarvamitam protam sutre maniganayo will become a reality is nothing no speck of dust other than me that we will see only by samaha sarveshu bhuteshu that is the hallmark of bhakti so he says mat bhaktim labate param bhaktim labate you will get that ultimate of the bhakti that you can think of so that is what uh, you know he talks about here i think i will stop here i prepared only this much i will stop here i think oh there is one more we can you can go on oh looks like there is some more you can go another 10 minutes is there then the next set of shlokas are on bhakti yoga because chapters 7 to 12 in various formats he talked about bhakti so therefore he has summarized with a few shlokas again from chapters uh, 7 to 12 because uh, in uh, he talked about dhyana he talked about, look at how the flow of topics are he says that's exactly the flow in bhagavad gita clean up your work let work not disturb you find your dignity of labor align yourself to the true nature so that you will really inner growth will happen align yourself to your nature your inner growth will definitely happen you'll have more me- meaning making that's all he discuss up to 48th shloka gunas how guna influences your karma and how guna and karma influences your varna how it is important that you work through that and then improve your varna through your improving your guna and so on so all that he said then he got into dhyana this is what happened up to 5 he talked about karma karma sanyasa jnana karma sanyasa then he talked about dhyana yoga so that is what you see here also from then he moved on to jnana vijnana yoga where he said you know ch- 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 chaturnam you know artha artarthi right jignasa and jnani bahunam jnanam ante jnanavan mam prabhutyate vasudeva sa mahatma sa durlabah so slowly he brought bhakti same order he is going here he is concluding with this actually he talks about some of the important aspects of bhakti in the last few shlokas before the teachings end सर्वकर्मान्यपि सदा कुर्वाण मत्यपाश्रय मत्प्रसादावापनोति शाश्वत पदम अव्यय सर्वकर्मान्यपि सदा कुर्वाण नो प्रीवियस श्लोक अर्लियर श्लोक ओनली दैट स्वकर्मण तम अभ्यर्थ्य सिद्धि विंदति मानव दट इज वाट ई सेंग अगेन की डूइंग युअर वर्क find peace with your work today our biggest problem is work is the greatest source of my depression my unhappiness oh he got promotion i didn't get you know he is going faster i am going it has really occupied our mind where is the self where is this individual self going to grow if you allow only that to happen so the only way to solve that problem is two things work and say everything that work also i, I actually give it स्वकर्मना तम अभ्यर्च इट इज एन अर्चना फॉर द गाड टू वर्क लाइक दैट एंड वॉट एवर रिसल्ट दैट कम आउट ऑफ इट टेक इट एज अ प्रसाद ऑफ द गाड दिस इज द ग्रेटेस्ट वे दिस इज द ओनली वे वी विल गेट आउट ऑफ वर्क अदरवाइज थाउजेंड्स ऑफ जन्मास वील ओरी ओनली अबाउट वर्क डस इन मैटर वॉट वर्क इट मे बी क्लीनिंग एट होम इट मे बी वर्किंग इन एन ऑफिस इट मे बी डूइंग सम वर्क इन द टेम्पल यू नो सम सेवा एवरी वेर द सेम इश्यू इज देर सेम इश्यू अनलेस वी डू दीज टू we will never win the war of work and avidya you know mrityum titva vidyaya amrutam ashrute is what isha varshi upanishad says you these are all avidya you had first cross the ocean of birth and death by knowing this avidya then let's talk about vidya which is this so cleaning karma may coming to a state where karma cannot bother me any more is the most important most critical first step in our inner development that's why again and again he is coming that's why he says swakarmani api sada kurvana ha always doing one's own work but mat vyapashaya ha you fix me you fix you into me that's what he said in chapter 8 there is a nice shloka 
इसे तस्मात् सर्वेशु कालेशु मा मनुस्मर युद्यच मैयर पित मनो बुद्धि ही मा में वे शेषी नशम्शय है Always remember me and fight. Always remember me when you do this. Mat vipashraya. That's what he says. Sada karu kuruana hai. Sarva karma nyapi. Sarva karma nyapi sada kuruana hai. Mat vipashraya hai. You keep remembering. See this Karaga dancer. She or he has this big part. That person may do any kind of trick. But the attention will be always on the part. That is, these days they are not able to, they tie it and all that they do. But the point is, that locus, epicenter of our existence is God. Keep it. Ramasha Paramsa says, hold only your, hold your hand onto the pole. And then you do whatever you want to do, you will not fall. One hand must be firmly held on the pole at the middle. And then do whatever tricks you want to do to entice people in and village, these small little things they do and collect some money. Mother and the son will come, you know, they will put one pole at the middle. Nowadays, I don't know whether it is there. I have seen it in my childhood. So, his Ramakshaparamsa uses that example. He says, don't leave this grip. Keep this grip always and do whatever you want to do. You know, you will not be lost. That is what Krishna is saying here. Mad Vyapashraya will do all the work. And if you do it, Mad Prasadat Avapnoti. You will get my prasada. It will happen. In fact, a person who is truly doing it will forget to look for the prasada. Till we look for the prasada, we are immature. Till we are looking for the prasada, we have not even conquered the act of doing work. If we have forgotten the prasada, we have actually gained. We have actually gone too far. The prasada will come. You don't even know when it comes. It comes. It's a edricha lava santushta. It's an extraordinary pleasure of uh, consuming that prasada must happen rather than looking for it and expecting it, looking around all the time, checking it and so on. So, mat prasadat apnoti sashvatam padam avyayam. The sashvata pada you will, you will attain by that and the only recommendation he makes is do what thinking about me, take what I give as your prasada. You do it. All that will melt and you will actually make a progress. Otherwise, this will distract you. You will be here. You will not even make one step forward. So that's what he is saying here. Then, because it's all about bhakti, there are some nice slokas here. He says, Chetasa sarva karmani mayi sanyasya matparaha buddhi yogam upashitya machittaha satatam bhava. This is the spirit of chapter 7, 8, 9. Ananya chintayantomam yejana paryupasate tesham nitya abhiyuktanam yogakshemam vahamyaham. Ananya chinta. Always think nothing other, don't think anything else. Na anya chinta, ananya chinta. You just think about me. Ananya chintayantomam is what he says. That's what he is saying here. Chetasa sarva karmani mayim sanyasya. You offer all your work with your heart and mind to me. So all these are bringing dignity and meaning to work. Dignity and meaning to work will come only when we do this. Not because your salary increases or somebody said you are doing a great job. They are all very temporary. Arambe visham, amritam, amritopamam, pariname vishamam, all those. They are rajasik sukha. This is actually sattvik sukha. What you discover inside. You should be Atma Ramaha. You should be able to Atman Yeva Tishtati, Atmanaha. All these are there in chapter 6. He revels in himself, he finds joy in himself, he is with himself. Atmana, Atmani, Atmanyeva, Tishtaha, like that shlokas are there in chapter 6. That is what it is. So he says, Chetasa sarva karmani mai sanyasya matpara, buddhi yogam upashritya, machittaha satatam bhava. You remember me all the time. That's why in Mukundamala he says, prana prayana samaye kapavada pittav, kutaste, you know, smaranam kutaste. Kantavarodhanam, you know, smaranam kutaste. He says, you know, when I finally die, I'll be choked all over the place. So, how am I going to remember you at that time? So, I will do, remember you right now and then you lift me right away. I mean, it's a great, Mukundamala is a great bhakti text. Kulashekara Alva, you know, every time I read, I have a hair rising experience. That's the ultimate of bhakti that you can enjoy. That's what he says. He says, how do I remember? It will all be competing with one another to choke you. That's why, Pranaprayana samaye kapavada pitte kantavarodhanam smaranam kutaste. 
How can I remember you, sir? Let me remember you now. I remember your Padara Vinda. No, is what he says. Everything will be gone. In fact, that's why he says, you know, Satatam Machitaha, Satatam Bhava. If you do it, you'll remember that at that time. That's the idea. It doesn't come just like that. No, yeah. If you are if you are invested, you know, if you are invested in the stock market and the stock is going down, and if you are so worried about it while dying, you'll remember Reliance share only. <laughs> we'll remember only what we are thinking all the time. Please understand. We'll remember what we are thinking. It's a simple idea. That Jadabarta stories, all those are uh, you know only to it's a sanketa actually, or you know Ajamila story are all sanketa. What it is saying is what you keep on remembering only will remember at the last time. You will not suddenly, you know, it's not a program where you just uh, load another program and this goes to the background, nothing like that. So all this value is there. So bhakti is all machitta satatam bhava, tasmat tasma sarve I have quoted all those here, these three shlokas. Tasma sarve shukale shumam anusmara yudhyacha, mayar pita mano buddhihi mame vayeshyesi asamshaya, that shloka, ananya chinta yento mame jana paryupasate. Yat karoshi, last shloka, beautiful shloka in chapter 9. Yat karoshi, whatever you do. Yat ashnasi, whatever you eat. Eat means not eat. Take whatever comes to you. Eating, yat akriyate tat aharaha. What comes in is called ahara. It's not just eating alone. Yat ashnati, yat juhoshi, whatever you offer. Eh? Dadasi, uh, offer as a yajna, uh, dadasi as whatever you give. Yat tapasyasi kaunteya, tat kurushwa madarpanam. Everything you offer it to me. All work-related problems will disappear if you can take the spirit of this. But the added advantage is we think about him all the time. What more can we really ask for? That is the pinnacle of bhakti. So that he summarized in a few shlokas like this. I think I will stop here. Now 7.30 I will stop. Uh, we will continue. Either next class we will finish. Or maybe one more class. After that I thought we have never done the Gita Dhyanam. We are doing only Bhagavad Gita. So we will... Maybe a class or two, we'll look at the, some shlokas are very good. Gita Dhyana shlokas. Yeah, that uh, Madhusudan Saraswati is uh, thing. So we will see that and uh, we'll be just about ready for the December 7th uh, with that. So we'll do it like that. Yeah, I can do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.